what we want to do is we want to start with accessible online training today. I'm Kevin Gummini, as you can see here, and my senior learning architect at MicroAssist. We're an Austin-based company that has a strong focus on developing accessible online training. We audit websites, we remediate websites, we audit training, we remediate training, we develop new training, all this kind of fun stuff that we really like to do. I want to make a special note that Scott Vessel and Hector Nagaris are also on as moderators, panelists, and so you might hear them speak as we talk. My phone number for the company is 512-794-8440. 512-794-8440. And my email is kgumienny at microassist.com. Now you're probably thinking, why did I tell you that, right? Because you can look at this screen and you can see it right there. Well, one of the things that we'll be talking about today is that when you're trying to make sure that your training is accessible and available to people with disabilities, somebody who might be completely blind or might have low vision, they need to zoom things up so they can see it, or maybe somebody who's hard of hearing or somebody who has, you know, has difficulty hearing. They may not be able to access that slide and get that information, so I want to share it with you. I might add that you see a picture of me in a suit jacket and a bow tie. I'm not wearing a bow tie right now. That would be considered information, uh, maybe not necessarily meaningful for our context, so I might not include that, right? So, when you're creating online training and you want to make it accessible, you've got to kind of think through these things. Another thing that you might want to see down here or that you might notice down here is I've got captions running on the bottom. It's an automatic system. We'll talk a little bit more about this. But what's brilliant about it is it's Microsoft Office 365 PowerPoint feature for both Mac and Windows. So if you have either of those two programs, you can use it. And it captures what you're saying, and it, this is completely automated. There's no humans involved. Can have caption systems with humans as well. So these are the things we're going to talk about. Open it up for questions. You've got the question panel on the Zoom webinar, right? should be down there at the bottom. You should be able to click on your QA feature and then send in questions, and either Scott or Hector will send me those questions, or I might take a look at them later after I've completed my part of the presentation, and we can talk about these things. Now, the reason that I gave you my phone number and my email address is I love talking about this. Now, fortunately, Scott and Hector have a mute button, right? And we've got an end time for this presentation because I guarantee you, if I had my way, I would just keep on talking. And I'm very passionate about this subject. Okay, we'll be talking about accessible online training. I do have a couple of notes that I want to share. At MicroAssist, there are some things that you can take advantage of. So, we have a series of newsletters, Accessibility in the News, Learning Dispatch, and Training News. If you want to know what's going on in the accessibility community, how people are thinking about accessibility, and where that appears in the news, every week, one of our people, Jack McElhaney, does a great job of summarizing and giving links to just a ton of articles to kind of keep you up to date. Every month, I send out a Learning Dispatch newsletter where I talk about the world of online training. I talk a little bit about accessibility. I also talk about more general issues. I might have a commentary or some curated elements, some curated comments, maybe an interview or two. And then training news is about our in-person offerings. And that's available at www.microassist.com slash about slash newsletter dash subscriptions. See, once again, I'm sort of reading the screen to you so that if you aren't able to access this, you can still collect the information. All of the information that I'll be talking about today as well as additional links. A lot of it's already available on a web page, and you might want to go ahead and just pop that open if you're at home or you can open it up on your screen. And that web page is www.microassist.com slash accessible dash online dash training. This presentation will be available on that page Tuesday, next Tuesday. I was going to do it on Monday, but then I remembered, hey, it's Memorial Day. So I'll make it available on Tuesday, and it'll be an accessible PowerPoint of this presentation that you can use. Also, please you know, use your screen capture utility if you see things here that you want to keep for later or have reference to. Then the other thing that I want to talk about is just this week, just Monday, we went live with a new online class, an on-demand class. It's about three to four hours, depending on how you take it, on how to create accessible PDFs. It's called Accessible PDF Fundamentals. And since you're here with us, we've created a coupon code for you. We already have an introductory rate of $99. And off of that, you can take an additional 20% by using the coupon code ATDATX-2022. 
dash G A A D two zero two zero. One of the neat things about that coupon code is it references the Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which is today. Today, there's a huge effort on all parts of digital entities that are talking about accessibility and sharing ideas about accessibility. So how cool is it that we get to talk about this topic over lunch today? Now, our code is time limited, so please take a look at it. And it does expire June 4th, 2020. And the location for our learning management system that you can take this at is the microassist.lms checkout. So all one word, LMS checkout.com. So you can go there and then hopefully use that code. So if you do take the course, you're all trainers here, right? So you know that I want you to fill out that survey at the end and let us know what you think so that we can improve the course. Okay. So. We're here. I was just talking with Hector a little bit about Austin ATD and you know some of the experiences now that we kind of all COVID-19 hit and we all moved to remote training and what that is like. So in March, you know, it was like we gotta go remote now. So Leah here at Austin ATD put a fantastic presentation on a couple of months ago that talked about how she adapted her in-person training to an online training event and all the effort that she put into it. And you've probably heard stories in the newspapers, there's a lot of information out there, blog posts, you know, training and social media about the experience that people have with remote training. And in March, it's got to go remote now. Our companies are moving to work from home. Our universities are closing. How do we continue training people? By April, by April, we pretty much have a handle on it, right? We've been doing it. Those people who have been out and about, maybe not connecting on an online realm, they're paying attention. They've been introduced to Zoom. They know how to, how to connect and log into the sessions and makes it an effective environment. So we feel pretty good. Then, of course, comes May, and we're thinking, wait, wait, wait a minute. Does this need to be accessible? Does this need to be available to people who have disabilities? Right? It's people who might be blind or low vision and might have hearing or just have hearing impairments people who uh, might have cognitive challenges or, or people who have mobility impairments so that they can't use a mouse or a trackpad, they have to use a keyboard. And the answer is yes. Yes, this all needs to be accessible. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because accessibility is essential when you're trying to train people to be better and hopefully the best at what they can do. Before we get into that, though, I want to take a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about when we say online training, what are we talking about, right? Every time I talk to somebody about online training, I tell you what happens, what does it mean for online training to exist? What do we mean when we say online training? So what you see right here is just kind of like a PDF of a page of, of a course where you can download the course manual. Hey, it's a PDF. It's online. Counts as online training. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely does. You might have a learning management system, and in your learning management system, you might have some online materials. Now, this could be on-demand course, a self-directed course of online materials, so you just log in and you take the whole course there, or it might be that what you've got online is an adjunct to an in-person experience. Is this online training? Of course it is. Video? Video is always online training, right? You can go in there, you can take a look at it, you can watch it hugely popular. How do I learn how to fix the ice maker on my refrigerator? I can guarantee, I can testify that it is through YouTube, and I can testify also that I've used it one too many times. And then, of course, we have what we often will call e-learning, you know, sometimes like potted plant training, you know, the kind of training that, that you might develop using a tool, a rapid development tool like Articulate Storyline, or maybe Trivantis Lectura or Adobe Captivate, and there's some other tools out there as well. Then, of course, probably what is more and more common over the past three months is our Zoom training, right? This idea that what we're doing with online training is we're trying to replicate an in-person event, and often we're doing a really good job of it, of replicating an in-person event and having people participate and share, have their video on, and be able to kind of have that same element, classroom element except in a virtual experience, so virtual in-person training. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the two basic approaches, 
of online training. And I kind of call them live and later. So live training is the training like we're doing here today with this webinar. It's a time-structured event. Generally, you have a guide or a, an instructor or a trainer or a guy giving a presentation who walks you through it at a given time. You can be affected. You can, you can talk to your audience, right? You can get feedback. You can shape it as you develop. And then we have training that's developed for later. So it's the kind of training that you might need to spend more time in. It's the kind of training that you can have a ramp up time that you can easily, you can cross over, right? So we have a session here. It can be made available at a later time as a recording. And that and then becomes later. And then we're going to be thinking about it differently, right? Later training might also be something like, hey, I've got this content available on learning management system, or I've developed this course in Storyline or Lectora or Captivate. Right? And I think that they both need to be accessible, which is to say that if you're doing live training, you need to be thinking about things like, hey, can someone who is blind get the information? What about someone who has a hearing disability or someone with low vision or someone with color blindness or someone with a cognitive disability? Right? So you need to be thinking about this as you're designing your training and you factor it in as you're building your training. And we'll talk about some details in just a minute. The thing with later training is you have all of those same questions, but now you don't have an instructor. Just like when we do instructional design on e-learning, you got to factor in the fact that there's nobody there to help out. If there's an issue, if there's something to think about, if somebody's having trouble accessing an area, there's no instructor. So you have to build accessibility right into the system. In live training, you build it in in your preparation, and you make sure to do things as you're going through. In later training, you need to factor it in and build it in as you go through. Now, why do you need it? Why do you need accessibility? Right, so some of you are, 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 might be thinking, hey, you know, I don't have anybody in my organization who has a disability. In fact, 61.4 million American, uh, U.S. adults report having a disability. So they meet the United States federal definition of having a disability. It's a lot of people. What's kind of even more impressive is there was a study that came out last year that said effectively 40% of people who meet the federal definition of having a disability do not disclose it. They do not disclose it. So while some people do, some people don't. There's no requirement that somebody who has a disability needs to share that they have one. Like only, I think, maybe around 30% disclose it to human resources. If somebody has a disability, 7% maybe. Almost nobody discloses it to the clients that they deal with. So just because somebody's not claiming to have a disability doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have anybody in your organization or among the students or among the learners or the, the people that you're working with who might benefit from designing things to be accessible. I might also add that disabilities don't have to be obvious. By looking at somebody, you can't really tell if they might have dyslexia. Right? So we tend to think of our more obvious disabilities, somebody in a wheelchair, somebody who's using a cane, somebody who has a hearing aid. But really, when it kind of comes down to it, you don't know. Right? And so by building accessibility into your training, you're making sure that this is available to them. And then the other thing to consider is that not all disabilities are permanent. Some of them are situational. If you've ever been into a crowded bar or in an airport, you might not be able to hear what's on the television, so you might be reading those closed captions. You might be a bartender who's operating in a noisy environment. Some of them might be situational, and some of them might not be permanent. You might have two broken arms. Temporary situation, but at the same time, with two broken arms, it's really hard to operate a keyboard or a mouse. So how do you operate? Now, you might be thinking, you know, that's good, but why am I making my stuff accessible? Why am I making it usable? I kind of think, um, you know, I really like this idea of accessible e-learning, accessible online training enables all employees, all employees, regardless of whether or not they choose to report a disability, to reach their full potential. I think that's huge. I think that's huge. We're in training a lot of times because we want to make people better at what they do. Right now, I, was, I did some interviews with uh, some people earlier this year, kind of late, late last year and early this year. And one of the most inspiring things 
that I heard, I was asking, well, how do you explain to people what you do? You know, if they're not in learning and development, how do you explain what you do? And she said, you know, I tell people that I help people become better at what they do. That's what training is all about. I just love that. I think it's huge. And then to think about, okay, now we can fold accessibility into that as well. Because what about those people who might not be able to see their screen without their reading glasses? What about those people who might be able to do their job just fine at a very high level, but they can't access training, right? Because the training's not designed to work with a screen reader. By making things accessible, we're enabling all people to participate. You might have somebody uh, in your organization, or you might know somebody. Uh, you might be know of an organization that requires compliance training in order for continue, like annual compliance training, you know, sexual harassment training or ethics training to continue working, right? If that training is not accessible, that might be a high-performing employee, but now they don't have access. You might have situations where you're introducing a new process or a new procedure or a new software. If the training that's associated with those new areas is not accessible, then they're not able to contribute their full potential, both as an individual and to the organization in which they belong. So it's huge. I think that's one of the most powerful things about making online training accessible is that we're just able to empower people when we do so. You, you take what you do as a trainer or as a training manager or as an instructional designer or as a course developer. You take that goal of helping people become better at what they do and you make it available to everyone. Super. Now, 100% behind that, I think we also need to recognize that there are some legal ramifications to not having your training accessible. It's a little bit less now over the past few years, but there's still a big push to include websites and training that's hosted on websites under the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title III, which means that even if you're not involved in government on a federal or state or a local level, you're a private organization, you can still be sued for not having your stuff accessible. That's not really been codified as yet, but in, in law or regulations, but it is definitely very, very present in the court system. If we're talking about higher institutions of higher education, Section 504, you might have heard of Section 504, mandates that all educational institutions, if they take even one dollar of federal money, that their electronic information meets standards of accessibility. And of course, Section 508 might be the thing that a lot, it's what I hear most often when I'm talking to people. It's actually, it's kind of a narrow thing. It's powerful. It's a narrow thing. And it, it, um, it's talking about federal agencies. Right? And federal agencies is a procurement standard that's, that says in order for federal agencies to buy information and communication technology, things that fall under that definition, it has to meet certain requirements regarding accessibility. Now, this also is not only what federal agencies tend to buy, but also what they create. So anything created by a federal agency has to do that. And then what you also find is that a lot of states and a lot of municipalities and local governments incorporate Section 508 by reference. That's what the state of Texas does for any of you in the state of Texas. So we have, we have the law. We have reasons to make your stuff accessible. But we also have just the reason and the power of educating and enabling all employees, all of your trainees, all of your audiences to gather everything that they need. What does it mean to make something accessible? This is kind of fun. Common barriers can just, they can just overwhelm you. All of the stuff that needs to be done. Right? And I'm going to talk a little bit about some guidelines in just a second. Captions on videos need to be there. Right? So I have to have captions going on in my presentation. Right? Color contrast has to be sufficient for somebody with low vision or color blindness to be able to perceive the text against the background or perceive one image against another or one shape against another. Lack in a visible focus indicator is kind of huge. It's sort of like when you tab through a website or training, and then they ask a multiple choice question, right? And you've got four options. How do you know which option you're actually on? So the focus indicator will indicate that, hey, you're this one. So if you select this one, this is what you're going to say. Missing incorrect alt text, keyboard traps. I'm not going to go through these all. They'll be available in the presentation after we distribute it. There's about 16 of them here. The, the big thing is that there's huge, there's, a, there's just a lot of these things that are, are kind of required 
so that somebody who has a disability can access your training. Now to help out, there is what's called the WCAG, also pronounced WCAG. It's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. The most recent current version is version 2.1. And they have four areas. And in those four areas, they've got a series of guidelines. And the guidelines, they've got a series of success criteria. About 70 or so success criteria. It's a lot, right? And the idea is, like you can see this text alternatives is the first one here on this page. This is just a, a screen capture of the WCAG a quick reference page. The link is on the website. I showed it at the beginning, I'll show it again at the end. And you know, alternate text makes, basically if I've got an image, if I'm dealing with somebody who can't see, who's blind, then I need to provide that information. If that image is meaningful in context, I've got to convey that information somehow. So I need to have alternative text or alternate text or alt text available. So there's a whole bunch of these criteria. And if you meet them, if you meet them, then it's not a guarantee that your training can be usable by everybody, but it's, it, it, it makes it more likely that somebody is able to access your training. So, you know, 16 at least common barriers that we talked about, this whole 70 plus success criteria that you have to master and how do I meet them and how do I know? Now you have this entire pressure on you because now I've just been telling you that your training might not be available to everybody. So I want you to take a minute. Right? At the top of my screen, I got my little guy doing his, doing his meditation pose. Right? Take a moment. You got this. You really do. I mean, think about if you're, if you're managing people. Managing people isn't, isn't easy, right? Managing trainers, you know, those trainers on the same page and, you know, to instruct the same thing and, sorry, not throwing shade at trainers uh, uh, that, you know, as trainers, actually, you know that you're working with an audience and in that audience, they might be engaged, they might be disengaged, right? You got to figure out how to engage them. You might have somebody who's disruptive. How do you bring them along and encourage them to help everybody learn in this experience? If you're designing e-learning, you know, you could do like click next, click next, click next, and that's really kind of boring and it's not really effective, right? So what you've done is you've studied all these great people who have done so much to help make e-learning more effective, people like Kathy Moore and Connie Malamed and Clark Quinn to kind of just really kind of help you become a better designer all the time. Our goal is to help people become better at what they do, and we master so much in order to do that. Accessibility is another thing, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It takes additional time to master, and it means it does take additional effort to make sure that your stuff is accessible. But you already do this in so many areas of what you do. You already do this. And so you've got this. You can kind of take it, you can move your training up to the next level in terms of accessibility. Okay, so now, Let's talk a little bit about some of the requirements and some of the things that you might think about doing when you are designing something to be accessible. So one thing is, let's talk about an in-person session. How do I help my in-people session be more accessible? One thing is live. Like if you're doing it live, describe what you're doing. So I talked a little bit about, um, about reading the content on the slide when I started this presentation describing what I'm doing. I have gotten a little bit of shade thrown my way. Oh, you're just reading the PowerPoint slides. I'm like, yeah, I am. But in that particular presentation, I had somebody who was blind in the audience. And so how were they going to collect that information and know what I was talking about if I didn't read the slides? So you need to convey the same content. You have to describe what you're doing. If you're training somebody on how to use a software program, Describe what you're doing as you're going through it so that somebody can follow along, right? Closed captions help not just for people who have hearing impairments, but also for people for whom English might be a second language, right? So now they can read the captions more slowly, go follow what you're doing. So describe what you're doing. Now back to the PowerPoint presentation thing. I like PowerPoint. I, I really do. I think it's a great way of conveying information, but at the same time, we can use PowerPoint be an augmentation to your presentation. 
right? So that if you're concerned about reading a lot of information on the slide, design your slides differently, right? Going back a, a little while, y'all might have read or be aware of Gar Reynolds' presentation Zen. Nancy Duarte has a series of books, really, really great work, Slideology, Resonate, Illuminate, that talk about uh, you know, how to do good presentations and how to augment your presentation, how to design your PowerPoint slides. So it might be that you need to design your PowerPoint slides in a very, very, in a different way so that they augment what you're saying and you're not reading the slides to people. So it's something to bear in mind, right? Another thing to think about, now it's just me at this point who's talking. You know, Hector and Scott, they're on the line, they're co-panelists, but so I'm sort of like walking you through this. But if you've got a lot of people on your presentation, when you're doing your training, it's always important that one person speaks at a time, especially in an environment where you might have a bunch of people, like a classroom session that you're doing online. You might have 30 people there. If all 30 people start talking at once, or in a smaller session, maybe they're muted if it's that large, but in a smaller session, you might have 10 people. Not unreasonable, but if people are talking over each other, somebody with cognitive impairment may not be able to distinguish. Heck, a lot of people just aren't going to be able to figure out who's saying what. Closed captioning services, especially ones, automated ones like the one I'm using here, they can't necessarily distinguish between speakers. So who is speaking? Who's saying it? One person speaking at a time is great. And that also goes into that third point, say your name every time you're speaking. All right? If Scott joined in, I'd ask Scott, hey, Scott, say your name. Or Hector, same sort of thing. Because, and I'm sure you've all been on those conference calls, when you can't see anybody, and everybody, and, and you know, people switch and talk amongst each other, say your name every time before you speak. Because you've been on those conference calls when people start saying things and they forget to say their name because, oh my goodness, everybody knows what my voice sounds like. I've been talking with these people forever. New person comes into the mix. Somebody's voice changes, you're using closed captioning or using a captioning service, then all of a sudden you don't know who's talking. It's a good, good habit to get into. I will admit, and honestly, I feel silly sometimes doing it, but I still do it. I still do it. And I'll say, this is Kevin, uh, before I contribute so that I can intentionally bring people in. And then note the accommodations that are present that you have. So there's a lot of different kinds of accommodations. I went ahead and I, I talked a little bit about the captioning service down at the bottom and that that was present. I've let you know that although this presentation slide is not currently available, it will be available online in an accessible PowerPoint format on Tuesday. If I'm using a different captioning service, I might mention that captioning service and talk about sort of the things that you can do. I like PowerPoint service, but it has some limitations. It's not a human who's doing it, and a human can really add something to the presentation as you're doing it. So note the accommodations. Let people know what you're doing. Let people know how to interact. Another thing that's always very helpful is give people a contact information so that they can reach out to if they do encounter any problems. Because remember, this is live. This is happening right now. So if they come into an issue, they can get help right away. It's super. Now, one thing I will say I see missing a lot. I'm not guilty of this. This is why I'm bringing it to you. I've made this mistake. I want you to, to avoid making this mistake. Is making sure that any supporting documents, the training manuals that you're developing, the slideshows, the handouts, the activities, all of those are available in an accessible format. So Word and PowerPoint are actually pretty easy to work with. They've got a little accessibility checker button. If you don't get too complicated in your Word document, it can be pretty accessible. PowerPoint's the same way. PDF is a little bit more challenging. PDF gives you the possibility of being super accessible as you know, easy to use a screen reader for, easy to read, well organized, but to make it accessible and usable requires more investment. So consider accessibility when you're citing on format. Can I just send this PowerPoint presentation? I'll tell you something interesting. So if you log, if you send a PowerPoint show that really prevents somebody who needs to use a screen reader or other accommodation, other assistive technology, of fully accessing all the information in your presentation. So when you post that PowerPoint presentation, can you post the full unlocked file? If you need to lock the information, if you have a PDF, if you lock that information in the PDF, the screen reader 
can't get past your, your security. So screen reader user isn't able to access that PDF. So these are the sorts of things you need to think about or that's helpful to think about when you're working with documents. Check accessibility before providing. So i uh, talk a little bit about manual and, and automated testing. You know, you always want to, automate is good because it can help you get through things quickly, but you always want to go back with manual testing because automated doesn't cover everything. But a lot of programs today have really kind of helpful things, right? You can, there's, a, there's an accessibility checker built into Word. You just need to go and click it and it'll report out. There's an accessibility checker built into PowerPoint. And it's not going to catch everything, but it, and it will make some recommendations, like it'll say, hey, check content order on a slide for a logical reading pattern. It can't decide what's the logical reading pattern, but it gives you that added oomph to try to check it yourself. PDF Adobe Acrobat has built-in accessibility checker. And then also, we've got, when possible, send accessible versions in advance. Now, the idea is that you want to provide people. So, this webinar, right, I'm, I'm sharing this PowerPoint, and in this PowerPoint, if you had it in advance, you could have it up in an assistive technology off to the side and then follow along. So I say, when possible, send it in advance. I'm horrible about this, as you know, right, because I've already told you, I'm not going to have the accessible version ready until Tuesday. That's why I stuck in that little wishy-washy phrase, when possible. Really, you should do your best to get it out and available. My particular issue many of you might also have this, is that I'm adjusting the stuff to the very last minute. And then so it's not the final version. So it takes me a little bit of time to get from the final version to an accessible version. It's a reason, not an excuse. And it's not something that really should stop me from putting this as accessible as possible and making it available online. So what about your tools? Your tools matter a lot. So I talked a little bit about Word and PowerPoint and an Adobe, but also think about which session you're using. Zoom, GoToMeeting, Microsoft Teams, all of these have a great way of being accessible and allowing somebody with assistive technology to navigate. We've been using Zoom even before the big old Zoom plosion, um, you know, earlier this year, because we found in our user testing and when talking with people, it tends to be the most open to assistive technology. On that website, and there, here, there's a link down at the bottom of this, uh, www.microsys.com slash accessible dash online dash training. I have a link to a blog post by an organization called The Big Hack, and they have things to consider when you're looking and judging which session, which tool to use. Like Zoom doesn't have an automated caption system. Uh, Teams does. The automated captions you're seeing here are through PowerPoint. But Zoom does allow you to incorporate third-party captioning services directly and other tools don't. So you need to find a balance. Now, I wouldn't say a little sort of thing about cost. You might find that you're in a position where your organizations are decided on what their delivery tool is going to be. You might not have a lot of freedom to make an assessment and choose the best one. Yeah, it happens. Absolutely. In that case, it's a matter of figuring out which are the most accessible features and then building off of those features, using those features, and also noting the accommodations, as we talked about just on the previous slide. Let people know, hey, you know, we have to use, oh, we don't have to say we have to use this, right? But you can say, in this particular program, we found that the chat is not accessible, so please you know, call this number if you've got some questions. You know, I mentioned CART video captioning services, which is a great way to caption your videos. I've also, if you're posting, if you're, if you're using transcription service, I've had experience with Descript and with Rev.com. Descript's kind of cool because if you record your audio, now I'm talking this through, I'm thinking maybe this is more later, but still, I'll talk about it now. If you record your audio, you can send it there and they'll do an automatic transcription. YouTube does the same. And just like with YouTube, you've got to go back and check it because it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. And your captioning needs to be as perfect as possible. And your transcripts need to be as perfect as possible because people are depending on those for information. If your transcript's missing periods or it has incorrect punctuation, if somebody's using a screen reader as an assistive technology to read it, it's going to read really funky, and they're going to spend more time thinking about what are they saying than considering the content of what you're sharing. 
Rev.com is another great service. I'm not so much endorsing any of these. I'm just kind of just, well, I guess, saying that they're a great service. It's kind of like an endorsement now that I hear myself speak. But I have used Rev.com, and they have a more hands-on. They're more expensive, but they've got a hands-on of very, very high accuracy. Okay, so what does accessible training look like when it's done live? Well, obviously, I'm hoping you're using this presentation, this webinar, as an example. But this is also what I've got on the screen is a slide from a presentation that was put on several weeks ago by the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, IAAP. It's a good combination of the Minnesota IT services and an organization called PETE. Then there's links to all of this on that webpage. One of the things I liked about this was, and this was a presentation on accessible meetings. Here's a tip. If you find that you're not seeing a lot of information on accessible training, try searching for accessible meetings. People may not be thinking about, hey, we have to make our training accessible, but they are very much so, especially in the last three months, thinking about, hey, we need to make our meetings accessible. Okay, so some things I like about this is um, down at the bottom, we have Jay Wynott. They've got captioning, and you see Jay introducing himself, Jay speaking. Right, so we know who's speaking. I thought that was really great. Another thing that kind of gets often overlooked is color contrast. Colors have to have sufficient contrast. So we have managed contributors in white. That's against a nice dark blue background. And we also have black text against a white background for the screen content. Very clear, very powerful. You may be in a situation where you have to use organization colors or themes, and you don't have the freedom to choose your own. In that case, it might be worth having a conversation with the marketing team or whoever is in charge of that. So we're saying, hey, we really kind of need to make this accessible. How do you know whether something meets contrast ratios? On this site, I'll give you a couple of names and then there's some links on, on the, on the web page there. If you use the Paciello Color Contrast Analyzer, it's the Paciello Color Contrast Analyzer. They have a version for Mac and a version for Windows. You can download it to your computer and you can run and check colors there. If though you don't have privileges to download stuff onto your computer, WebAIM has a very nice color contrast checker where you identify the RGB or the hex code val color values, and you can check color contrast there. And it tells you, hey, we meet level AA criteria for normal text or large text, or we meet level AAA criteria. Now, always go by what your organization says when you're looking at color contrast ratios. However, I will say that for the most part, it's the level AA is what most people are looking for when they are looking at color contrast. The odd things about these is you get a lot of information, but you don't necessarily get information about why you should pay attention to these things. All right, so let's talk a little bit about accessibility later. Accessibility later is about creating training that's going to be consumed later. You have more of a roadmap so you have more of a ramp up time to get there. That's kind of cool. They can definitely be linked together. Recording this presentation and posting it later is both a live event and then as a recorded session later. Because you have that ramp up, because you have that time, I think about accessibility later, training that's delivered later um, and not live in a different way. What you see here is the micro assist process design and development. Don't take, don't, don't capture this one. I got a better one. I got a better one. Then, then I really encourage you to do a, a screen capture or check the presentation that I'll be posting on Tuesday. But basically, I'll kind of just kind of give an overview so you can get a sense of what this is. Each of these stages, visual design stage or an analysis stage, we have certain things we look at. Like a visual design stage, we're looking at sample content, colors, button layout. Analysis, we're looking at, hey, what are the goals? What are the objectives? What are the evaluation strategies? And then we move to a content design where we sort of say, okay, how is the course going to achieve its goal? And we look at techniques and activities and methods. And then we take it that to a storyboard. Right? And in that storyboard, what will the participants see? Well, they'll see images. What is the on-screen content going to look like? What is the narration going to say? And then that leads to the program module where somebody's using a tool to create it. And then it's testing. Does it function as it's expected? Navigation, layout, feedback. This last bit, that's where people tend to check accessibility, the testing stage, right? Hey, we've developed it. We spent, you know, two, three, four, six months developing this training. Is it accessible? Let me go and check. 
well, think about, oh my goodness, what might happen if the colors don't meet contrast? I know I hit that a lot today, but that can really, now you got to go all back to the visual design and you've got to change everything on all of these pages as you're going through. Tremendous amount of work. What if one of your very innovative and engaging interactions can only be manipulated by the mouse. It's a drag and drop. Now somebody can't use the keyboard to access it. I've got to go back and redesign. Maybe I have to get it reapproved and go through the process again. Checking accessibility at the end is a really tough place to do it. This is the screen. If you were going to capture one, this is what I would capture. So what we've done, and we've used this process several times, and we found that it makes pretty effective training, we incorporate everything at the appropriate stage. And this you can do too, right? So when you're looking at colors and your button layout, think about this is the time to check contrast, all right? If you're thinking about analysis, this is a great time to think about cognitive strategies. How are you going to chunk this to make it useful? You're probably already doing this. Content design, this is the time to make sure that all of the activities that I build in manipulated using a keyboard. Storyboard, this is where I put in my alternative text. This is where I make sure that my heading structure exists, making sure that everything has proper directions. If I get to a multiple choice question, sometimes you might think, oh, everybody knows how to do that. A certain instance, that's true, right? You choose one of the options, but technically, how do you do that? Maybe you need additional instructions for keyboard users or screen reader users, how to manipulate and how to maneuver among the elements. And the program module, when you're doing development, this is when you think about tab order. Semantic markup might be where you, where you actually make sure that the captions are built into the program. What's beautiful about this is then at the testing stage, you're confirming that everything's been done. Hey, stuff happens. I used to do this, so this goes back a little ways. I think it doesn't necessarily happen that much anymore. One of my favorite development fails is always when you're in a course with audio and the audio is playing and you click the next page before the audio finishes and then the audio continues to play from the previous page and the new page audio starts. Always love it when that happens. You just got to go back in and fix it. That stuff happens all the time when we're testing for development, right? Same thing with accessibility. You might find that a new element snuck in and that you're not measuring contrast and that the contrast didn't get measured. That's the sort of stuff you check here, right? Maybe on one page, the tab order is misaligned, or maybe, on a, maybe there might be a heading that's not marked as a heading level one, right? So it's got marked as just plain paragraph text or something. If you incorporate accessibility all throughout the process, oh my goodness, it makes testing so much easier and so much faster. So what are your options? Now, if you're, if you're designing training for later, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can create from the bottom up, you design it to be accessible like we just talked about, I'll put that some more accessible. Another thing that you might do is audit your existing training if you've got a large catalog. Hey, do your videos have captions, right? It can tell you an audit what doesn't change the accessibility of what you have, but it does tell you what you do well and what needs to be better. You know, do you have captions? Are your, as we talked a little bit earlier, are your color contrast ratios, are they contrasty enough? You can also rebuild existing content. I've done this uh, several times where you take existing course content and you develop it in a more accessible tool. The most accessible tool that you're going to use, to be honest, HTML. As if you can build your course in HTML5, you are allows the greatest level of control. The WCAG standards are designed to work with HTML. You can just, it really knocks stuff out of the park. Problem is, being an expert in HTML, being an expert in instructional design and course design, two very different skill sets. So we tend to use these solutions like our rapid development tools. But if you can rebuild it in HTML, it's huge. And then the last one, this happens a lot. I've got a course, it's already built. I can't change the content. I just want to make it accessible. This is an honest thing. It's absolutely correct. It happens all the time, but it's also the most difficult to make accessible because your tool might have limitations. The content might have limitations. Okay, so know your tool. So think about, are you going to use an Articulate Storyline, Electora Inspire, or Captivate? Are you going to use a learning management system? Are you going to use your video player? Each of these tools deals with things differently. I might add on that video player, 
something that a lot of people don't think about is, yeah, you can make sure your captions are there, make sure your transcripts are there, but can you control all of the elements of your video player, the volume button, the pause button, the play button, using the keyboard, right? So it's these sort of things you need to consider. And so what does it look like? Well, accessibility later can look like, this is a page from a Moodle exam, it's called Setting Up Acrobats from our PDF course. Basically, you can see that I've got content laid out, accessible via a screen reader, and then I have a video of a how-to steps to follow that has captions. I always turn my captions on by default, make it accessible, easy, from the go. People can always turn them off if they don't like them. And then at the bottom, you may not be able to see it because it's kind of small, is you've got the transcript. Or you might have a course, uh, the top element has a question, how do I incorporate this? The problem with this approach is it's a great approach. The difficulty with it is it's very repetitious. So you can design it. And the second one, we have a statement where I say, uh, for communication strategies, take your time, use I instead of you. And then, but it's just a radio button. So it's much easier to use I. This is a great example. It's not mine, I stole it. I just wanna let y'all know that. But I love the way that it takes the instructional objective of the question, keeps it consistent and equally interactive but interprets it in a way where somebody who's using a screen reader or a tab key is going to be able to use it pretty easily. Okay, so much to talk about, so much to talk about. And I've only got five minutes left for questions. So the first thing to say is, if you don't get your question answered, email me. Email is k-g-u-m-i-e-n-n-y at microsys.com. I love talking about this stuff. I will talk your ear off. The second thing to say is go to the resource page and you'll have a lot of links there that it can be really helpful to explore. www.microsys.com slash accessible dash online dash training. The third thing to say is I just want to emphasize again that we have this brand new course that we just stood up on how to make accessible PDFs, sort of a fundamentals course, gives you the basics. And the coupon code for that for 20% off of our introduction rate is ATDATX dash GAAD. 2020, right, and it expires June the 4th. Wow, this is great. Okay, so I just saw there's a whole bunch of questions, and I'm going to talk about these um, for just a few minutes. You know what? I can stay on for a little bit longer and, and answer additional questions if you've got them. So the first question we have is, do you have tips for facilitating discussions when hosting a presentation in a video conferencing format? such as methods for managing turn-taking without people feeling shut down or intimidated? That is a fantastic question. I mean, it really is, because when we're doing training and we want everybody to participate, there's always the risk of somebody jumping in and taking over the conversation. People who might want to contribute get shut down. I think Augustina asked this question, and I don't really want to punt, but what I would say is I found that a lot of the techniques that you use in person can also be effective online. So nothing as harsh as meeting somebody, right? But sort of like, we've heard from so-and-so, it's a great point, I'd like to open it up for other people to, to answer. I think that's a really kind of helpful thing. A lot of times in a live active video conferencing session, it becomes important to use the same kind of techniques. Now, the other thing I would say, just in the same way as you would in a classroom, lay down the ground rules first or establish the ground rules and build off of those. So let people know, hey, if you've have a lot to say, we might move on to somebody else and give somebody who hasn't had a chance to say. A lot of the same techniques. If you're interested in exploring this more, um, I highly recommend, uh, Michael Wilkins, I think, has a great book called The Secrets of Facilitation. And it's all about just exactly that. How do I manage people? How do I make an effective session? So Rick asks, given the Zoom plosion, many JAWS users are using Zoom and JAWS simultaneously. JAWS will not voice screen being shared with the JAWS user during the Zoom sessions. Does anyone have suggestions or know how to get JAWS to read shared screens, such as shared PowerPoints or Excel sheets? Oh, that's such a great question. I don't really have an answer for that one. At the moment, I'm gonna look into it. I'm gonna let you know what I find out, Rick. So um, if you wanna shoot me an email, then I can also talk about ways that we can distribute this answer out to everybody who asked it. What is the best authoring tool to use to create content is what Martha Lopez asks. That's a really hard question. It kind of depends on what you want to do. I've recently had some decent success with using an adapt framework to design HTML based authoring content, but you have to be pretty well versed in HTML to do that. 
We generally find no tool is perfect, but I would say that like Trivantis's Lectora does a really good job of giving you a lot of control over features such as your heading levels and make sure the content is available via a screen reader. And I find that that's not perfect. A lot of places use Articulate Storyline, which is getting better, but I think Trivantis Lectura still has the edge. Okay, we're at one o'clock. Thank you so much for participating and sharing all of these great questions with us. I have been seeing the chat go up. I've not been looking at it, just so you know, focus on what I was sharing with you guys. And so thanks again, and thanks again to Scott and Hector for allowing us this opportunity to talk to you about accessible online training. If you've got responses, if you've got additional questions, I see that there are a few kind of coming up. We're out of time. I'm going to stick around a little bit longer and I'm going to talk about it. But for those of you who need to get off, thanks again for attending. Really appreciate it. Okay. So I'm going to leave up my caption and I'll stick around until everybody has their questions answered. Janina Besa Siebert asks, while attending a panel for accessibility in an online learning environment, one of the panelists mentioned how distracting the ongoing chat was because JAWS read all the chat noise over the presenter. Oh, wow. Another panelist with ADHD agreed. Many people, as we saw in today's chat, enjoy connecting using the chat. How would you suggest creating a welcoming and inclusive space in these environments? Such a great question, Janina. I think that's, that's really neat. I find the same way. I mean, this is exactly why I had the chat off because I knew that if I had the chat open and I was kind of reading through it, all I would do would be just trying to keep up with and paying attention to the chat. I believe in Zoom, you can actually turn the uh, chat function off so that it's not available. Now, that does cut down on the participation, absolutely. But at the same time, I think it kind of goes also into explaining those accommodations and explain why you set it up the way you have. And providing an alternate tool that people can use, even something as simple as an email address that people can send questions to so that it's kind of completely offsite might be something else to consider. That's a really great question. Jay Harris notes that they are interested in the JAWS question regarding Zoom Teams and shared screen. Okay, so we've got a couple people interested in that and we will definitely follow up on that. I'm gonna open up the chat now. Now remember, I haven't been looking at the chat, so I'm going to uh, just kind of do a quick look through See if there's any questions that popped up here. We still have the question pane open, so if anybody's here. So Carmen has a great, I'm sorry, kind of going up a little bit. Uh, Carmen Matthews has a great point. It's really kind of cool. She notes that um, our automated testers will never catch everything. You really need to learn the standards if you want maximum accessibility. Absolutely correct. And part of this is the function of accessibility. Like a, an automatic checker can tell me if alt text is present, but it won't tell me what it says. What a lot of programs will do is they'll populate the alt text with the file name. So if I dump an image into uh, PowerPoint or a different tool, it might just say, you know, Shutterstock 102368.jpg. Not a lot of help, but it would pass the alt check tool, right? So you always need to follow up. I don't have the link with me, but let me make a note and I'll put it on our webpage. It has a neat standard uh, proposal that they just put out. It's sort of like a rough draft of developing testing strategies. And like in, if you've got very complex websites, which can also apply to training, how do we make sure that we test everything on that page? And so they have a great guide there about you know, the things that require manu manual testing and the things that can be turned over to automated testing. Generally speaking, the number that I tend to see get thrown around is that automated checking can only capture somewhere between 30 and 40% of accessibility errors. You got to do the manual check. You got to have a strategy involved in doing a manual check. All right. Oh, and uh, Jamie, Jamie Davis uh, has a great point about Austin ATD changed its color palette a few years back in order to be accessible. Our marketing team also created new standards of what color combinations could and couldn't be used with our burnt orange color. Well, I am an Aggie, so I have a little bit of problems with the whole burnt orange idea, but I will say that that's a great story of somebody who successfully worked with a huge organization, you know, UT Austin, absolutely huge, to bring people into and to help on a fundamental level, a very basic level, help things be accessible. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more questions. Oh, yes, uh, Carrie Collins, I'm sorry, I just popped up a little bit, Carrie, for still on. Wouldn't having all participants be muted unless speaking help avoid the uh, JAWS reader interfering with the presentation? 
Absolutely. And in fact, that's a good way. It kind of goes back to that facilitation question a little bit earlier about how do I get people to participate equally. If you make the standard that people mute themselves or you set it to automatically mute people as they come into the room, then it becomes a feature of you unmuting people and allowing them to participate. Again, I always stress, um, I've always found it helpful when I'm working with audiences to let people know what you're doing and why you're doing it without being mean about it, but let people know that this is what, this is the, the established ground rules of this presentation. Okay, we have one more question. Okay, fantastic. Oh, uh, Cheryl Ann Campbell says, I do a lot of public sector training sessions now being converted to online webinars. Could you clarify if accessibility requirements legally are dependent on knowing in advance if anyone needs them, or should every presentation comply? Okay, so I should have mentioned this throughout this entire presentation. I am not a lawyer, so I can't speak to the legal thing. It has been our experience that according to the regulations, once something goes online, it needs to meet accessibility uh, requirements. The model that you're, that, that, I, that's kind of implicit in knowing in advance if anyone needs them is often called the accommodation model. And that's very commonly used in like university situations where somebody might need a sign language interpreter for a university session, so they make that request. Or there's a test that comes up, and so an accessible version of that test is created. It's all well and good. It's been, again, not a lawyer, but it's been our experience is that the kind of baseline expectation is that something should be accessible when it goes online. Now, a lot of stuff is thinking ahead of times, right? So if you've got an automatic captioning service here, if you've got you know, a transcription service that you can run things through, that will help a lot. I might say that you might, if you're thinking about doing an automated service where you take your webinar and you send it off to them and let them transcribe it and send it back, it costs money. At the same time, it's also might be thought of, and the way I think about it personally, is a balance between, you know, how much time is it going to take me to transcribe this and caption it, and what is that worth, versus how much time uh, it's going to take a service to do it. Um, and we often find that the service is going to be less expensive in terms of man hours. If we're longer things, short things, not a problem. Five minutes, 10 minutes, that's great. But if I'm talking about an hour webinar or a two-hour webinar, I'll often send it to a service and have it done. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like that's about it. Oh, and then uh, Carmen mentions often use YouTube to get the captions and edit them. Yep. That's another great way to do it. YouTube captions have been getting better. They still need a lot of editing, but it's a great way to kind of shortcut some of that effort. Great point, Carmen. Okay. So again, hey, you know, y'all, thank y'all. Um, thank y'all so much. And thank you for hanging around a little bit extra. Really appreciate it. And again, thanks to ATD for, um, for spending the time and giving us the opportunity to do this. Y'all have a great day. Enjoy the long Memorial Day weekend, and hopefully I'll talk to y'all another time. Bye.